They no longer trust what comes from the tap. They bottle large amounts of water themselves because at home the water tastes of chlorine. Thousands of residents in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, come here every day to fill their canisters and plastic bottles. Some don't have home access to running water. This family shuttles in its daily supply by car. They get nothing from the water utility in Sofia. Look here, no water. It's all dry. Two years ago, their water supply suddenly stopped. We drive 12 kilometers to my mother's to get water. We can hardly manage to carry the big bottles. Look how heavy they are. The Bulgarian capital sold its public utility 13 years ago to save on government spending. The water supply moved into private hands. The world's largest water company now owns 77% of it, Veolia. Veolia, the environment is an industrial challenge. Veolia sees itself as a knight in shining armor for cash-strapped municipalities. Veolia to the rescue when states can no longer do their job. Veolia's corporate headquarters are in Paris. The company supplies drinking water to 100 million people around the world. Paris itself withdrew Veolia's concession after 25 years on the grounds of poor service and inflated prices. The multinational water corporations are becoming less popular in France and also in South America. So they're trying to gain a footing in other European countries. EU Commissioner Barnier, who is a great friend of Veolia and Suez, is helping them. He wants to liberalize the water supply in many EU countries so that the company can secure a share in those markets. If it were up to the European Commission, governments would continue to back out their public utility services, especially in crisis-ridden countries that need to save money. By taking over municipal utilities, private companies could protect their monopoly on the water market, to the detriment of citizens. Observers point out that non-elected EU committees of experts are unduly influencing national policy. Intergovernmental uh, panels such as the Troika, uh, where you know everything is secret, there's no transparency about what the Troika is doing at all, and that's a big problem. The Brussels bureaucrats' plans for water resources are indicated in a document which has drawn very little attention so far. And this is remarkable because for the first time ever, I think to my knowledge, the Commission is saying that it's, uh, the Commission believes that the privatization of public utilities, including water supply firms, can deliver benefits to the society when carefully made. I mean, this is in breach of EU law. This is in breach of the EU treaties that say that uh, the way uh, water services are organized and delivered is the responsibility of member states. Greece is particularly under pressure to privatize. The state has to save. Public companies are being sold off to private investors in a big way. Ida, the water utility in Athens, is no exception. It's been in public hands so far, but that's set to change. The government desperately needs money. When you invest, you want to make maximum profit. It's up to me to manage the expectations of the investor and match them with the expectations of the public interest.
Stelios Stavridis is the head of Greece's privatization agency, Taipet. In early May, he sold off part of the state lottery. Athens Water Company is next on his list. There are already interested buyers. You're not talking about selling or not selling the water. Mm. What you're selling is services. What you're giving is the services. Who will be invoicing? Who will be collecting? Who will be extending the pipes? Who will be uh, uh, repairing the pipes? Who will be doing all these things? This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about giving our water or our air or our sun to anybody, Germans, French, Austrians, etc., etc. No, on the contrary, we welcome you to come invest in our country. You benefit, we benefit, and this doesn't uh, work against the public interest. The Greeks themselves are less optimistic that they'll also benefit from the transaction. Selling airports and lottery companies is one thing, but water is a whole other ball game. People don't trust the investors. Atanasios Soutsos is the mayor of Palini, a suburb of Athens. The municipality buys its water from the Athens utility. The bill lands on his desk. In summer, the climate in Greece is very dry and the temperature gets quite high. The amount of water we need for our parks alone is enormous. The mayor takes us to the local pumping station. From this point on, his municipality is responsible for supplying water to every household. All the technical plants are in public hands and he wants it to stay that way. The trick is that in the run-up to privatization, the Athens Water Works was divided into two companies. One of them sells the water to us as a natural resource, and the other one operates the technical facilities. If a private business owner calculates the high cost of maintenance of the equipment, then the price for water automatically increases, even if the water itself hasn't been privatized. Those who'd be hit the hardest by higher water prices are the socially disadvantaged. Like Olympia Nicoletto's family, she has four children. Her husband's small income has to provide for the whole family. Their water costs are subsidized by Polini municipality. Here you can see that the higher tariff doesn't apply to us until 60 cubic meters, and not at 20 like with other households. We get a special price from the community and don't have to pay the base charge. The community supports around 300 families. The prices for water are staggered according to income. It's for reasons of social justice. Olympia Nicoletu doubts that a private company will have interest in that. An investor will do anything the law permits, especially with people like us, a lot of children and socially weak. A privately owned company surely won't respect the needs of low-income people like us. In Bulgaria, 13 years of privatized water shows what can happen when a large foreign corporation is put in charge of meeting people's basic needs. Victoria Shalamanova is a social worker in a suburb of Sofia. Middle-class Romanis live here in what is known as the faculty quarter. They could lead more or less comfortable lives if it weren't for the problem with the water supply. There is no pressure in the piping system. The residents are upset because they've been left behind. There's no water here. We have to go ask others for it. 
but they don't want to give us anymore. They're annoyed because we always came asking for water. But with no water, we can't even wash our dishes. You can't cook, wash or clean without water. It's a disaster. We can't live without water. Social worker Shalama Nova knows the stories. The problem started three years ago. When people complain and an engineer from Sofia Water has to come check the pipes, the homeowner has to pay for it. So the people don't even submit their complaints anymore. It's a monopoly of thieves. They're robbing us and we end up with nothing. The complex isn't very lucrative for the water company. As long as the government authorities don't intervene, nothing will change. I'll send a complaint to the European Court of Human Rights. I'll show them that I have legal documents for my house. They think we are Romanis and have a different lifestyle, but they're wrong about that. We need water too. In the middle of Europe, people deprived of their right to water. In this house too, nothing comes from the tap. Canisters are the only solution. Look, why is there no water? I've written to the president, I've written to the prime minister and to the ministry in charge of this. They say that these houses aren't in the building development plans. That's just an excuse. Of course. Here's my notarized entry in the land register. I pay all my taxes and I'm a citizen of this country, but my right is denied. What century is this anyway? I'll show you the letters of complaint. You don't need to. We get it. The Yet campaign tells a very different story. Ah, Professor Monsorez, a fictitious professor ensures high quality water. They guarantee optimal quality. The Veolia Corporation holds a 77% share of the waterworks in Sofia. We asked Sofia Water to give us a statement. It first consulted with Veolia headquarters, which issued the decision not to talk to us. We received the following written statement. The socio-political conditions here are quite complicated at present. This makes it difficult for us to address your questions. Someone who does want to talk with us is the former director of Sofia Water. Petko Petkov was the boss before the publicly owned company was sold in the late 1990s. We meet him at Iska Reservoir, which supplies 90% of the Bulgarian capital's drinking water. The investors pick cities that have a lake to secure the water supply. They don't even bother going to places where there's no easy access to water. Dobrić, for example, wasn't interesting for investors. There, the water has to be pumped up from deep underground. Of course, water from a lake makes things easier. In Sofia Town Hall, City Councillor Boris Cvetkov is leading the fight against the sale of public assets. He wants to undo the privatization of the last 13 years. Cvetkov, a member of the Socialist Party, is trying to launch a referendum on it. These are the signatures we need for a referendum. Thousands of people have signed in support of reversing the concession for Sofia Water. A look inside Sofia's canal system shows that the old infrastructure has never been upgraded. 60% of the water drains off before reaching consumers. 30% of the households aren't connected to the sewage system. 
The city councillor says the pledges to invest have evaporated into thin air. In the 90s, we and the citizens were told that the network desperately needed to be modernized. So we pulled in foreign investors who were supposed to use their money to upgrade the equipment, which they'd earn back later through fees. But they never invested any of their own money. I call that breach of contract. The French have more than a hundred years of experience with private water investors. Paris and other major cities have had a change of heart. Many municipalities have reversed the privatization process because people were fed up with the low water quality and higher prices. That isn't surprising because the private sector is driven to turn a profit. Previously, the deal with French mayors worked like a well-oiled machine. A kind of entry fee was fixed, meaning that the mayor signed a long-term contract and received a specified sum of money in return. In Montpellier, for instance, the mayor, Monsieur Fresh, signed a 20-year contract with Veolia in 1989. In return, Veolia funded the construction of a convention center. In other words, Veolia's investment was primarily financed by raising people's water bills. Of course, the residents of Montpellier weren't told this. Anne Listra is a city councillor in Paris and is responsible for the entire city's water supply. Under her leadership, Paris put the water business back into municipal hands. It enabled the city to pull the plug on huge price increases. Now profits are channeled back into the water supply infrastructure, she says, instead of into the pockets of shareholders. Now that it's public, the water supply has led to financial savings. The fact that only one operator is involved brings about 30 to 35 million euros in savings. That means we can keep up the investment and even increase it. The quality of infrastructure has stayed level, and the price of water even dropped by a few percent. Spain has very different water problems. Here, the precious liquid is in hot demand. Its scarcity, especially in southern Spain, sometimes creates bizarre scenery. Year after year, this is what it looks like around this reservoir in Almeria province. The biblical drought in southern Spain has brought many to their knees. No water, no life. Many people have left the region. In 2000, politicians thought they'd come a step closer to solving the problem. They wanted to use water from the Ebro River to supply southern Spain. More than a thousand kilometers of pipeline would be laid from north to south. But northern Spaniards protested against their water being used to irrigate golf courses. The project was stopped. Demonstrations continue to keep the Spanish on edge. Activists repeatedly pipe up against the water multinationals, like here in Zaragoza. Spaniards fear that commercial water companies will stake out their country, now that French and German municipalities are reclaiming the water supply in their communities. The critics here worry that water will be turned into a profit-making object of speculation. The blue banners symbolize Spain's rivers. The Spaniards have a knack for creating images that look good on TV. It's a manipulation by private enterprise. The public can't possibly stand for higher prices with no improvement to quality. The privately owned companies charge more than the municipalities. But they're in debt and now want to sell off their water to turn a profit with public assets. 
There's no proof that private owners will be cheaper or even more efficient. Commercial water suppliers Agua Barcelona and Suez pull the strings in northern Spain and the Balearic Islands. Agua Barcelona, of course, dismisses the criticism against market liberalization. Water is getting more expensive, and so is the technological context involved in it. But nothing works without us. We repair pipelines quickly. The technology is better. If problems arise, our customer service ensures that they get fixed. But the services provided by commercial operations have to be explained. Otherwise, people think we don't do or take care of anything. The water supply is a highly sensitive issue. Agua Barcelona knows that. And it's probably one reason why the water managers fully understand the need to conduct lobbying in Brussels. It has caused confusion and resentment among the ranks of parliamentarians, such as Greens party member Heide Rühle. I thought it was strange that Suez, which is one of the largest privately owned water companies in Europe, invited me to visit their waterworks in Barcelona. They offered to pay for the flight and hotel. Of course I declined. There's no question about that. But I wasn't the only parliamentarian to be invited like that. I think it's objectionable. Civil rights activists and trade unions have joined forces to prevent plans for privatization in Europe. They've collected more than a million signatures, protesting the sell-off of water. In our country, we've got a project called the Blue Communities. And a Blue Community is a municipality that decides they have to take a vote that they are going to protect their water as a public trust, um, as a human right, um, and also provide only public water. Canadian water activist Mort Barlow has come to Vienna to urge Europeans to rethink their austerity policy. Along comes the crisis, the financial crisis, and then the austere, so-called austerity crisis, and they come back around and they say, oh well, it's not because privatization is so good, you know, but we have no choice. We, you know, you have to sell off your water if you're, if you're going to get debt relief. Um, and it's a way of coming back to Europe and, and fighting the forces that have rejected privatization. So they want to start with Greece and Portugal and, and Italy and so on. Back in Greece, Athens isn't the only city making cutbacks. Thessaloniki is another example. Workers are rallying against a sellout. Their profitable water plant is to be sold into private hands, but they're putting up a fight. Costas Marioglu works in the repair service. He fears that his department will be the first to go. It's clear to us that if a private corporation were to take over here in Thessaloniki, they wouldn't be very interested in repairs. They concentrate on areas that are more lucrative. The repair service doesn't contribute to the company's bottom line, but for customers it's important for someone to come quickly. For instance, if a pipe is clogged. Mario Glu and his co-workers are usually on hand within 24 hours to fix such problems. Our water plant operation has never received public subsidies. The company has generated 93 million euros in profits over the past five years and has more than 26 million in reserves. What the government would get once from the sale, the company could generate in three to four years. Mario Glu has become an anti-privatization activist. And he has come up with an idea to get the residents to buy and manage the water utility themselves. 
Group 136 is the name of the effort to get every citizen to contribute 136 euros. In combination with a few larger donors, it might be enough to take over the utility. We think it's a good idea, because we can see all the privately owned waterworks going back to the municipalities. Now we're making the same mistake five years later. Are you willing to pay 136 euros? Yes, of course. A total of 4,000 people have signed up so far, but that's not nearly enough to actually buy the water utility. I'd give even more money if I knew that the plan is really sound, but my pension is just so small after so many years of working. It's an attempt to prevent dreaded foreign rule with a new concept of civic participation. The whole city has to sign. We have to find a different model of development. It can't go on like this. This is a wholesale sellout. The current public model is also weak because it led to many cases of privatization. If a mayor advocates public management today, how can we be sure that the next one in office will do the same in future? In the past, the Balearic island of Mallorca had other concerns. For years, the popular tourist resort was dependent on northern Spain for its water. For three years in the mid-1990s, billions of litres of water were delivered by ship at a cost of 36 million euros. The battle for the blue gold, which has agitated public opinion throughout Europe, has sailed right past Mallorca. The island is one of Spain's provinces where the water supply underwent privatization long ago. And Mallorcans think that's good. The communities here are glad about the private investors who have been managing the island's water supply for years. Chaotic public management is now a thing of the past, at least for the water supply. Water used to come by truck. Then it was pumped into containers and we got it through pipes. Then the privately owned businesses came and laid pipes and channels. The supply is better now and the price is okay, but the water still doesn't taste good. It tastes of chlorine. We all drink mineral water here. Nonetheless, 20% of the potable water still gets lost in the pipes. There's no centralized supply. The municipalities don't have enough money to finance water exploration. That's an ever more expensive endeavor being left to the private water utilities. People are happy. They don't have to worry about supplying water themselves anymore. They don't have to wait for rain. They now have running water around the clock. That didn't used to be the case. The private companies have also committed to regularly monitoring the water quality. Mainland Spain and other European countries look at Mallorca with surprise. No battles have erupted about the bubbling spring sources. The people apparently trust the private suppliers. Words of warning from critical activists go largely unheard here, when in fact market liberalization is a matter that affects everyone in Europe. You've got to ensure that everybody has basic access to water, to health care, to the essential public services of life, otherwise you're going to create a, an underclass in this country, in Europe, that is going to be a permanent underclass. If the privatization of these essential services, along with the growing poverty and the cuts, cutting of pensions and the cutting of uh, minimum wage, all that goes together, you're going to see people without water access in Europe. The tough struggle for water is set to go into the next round. One and a half million citizens have signed an EU initiative to keep water in public hands. 
Meanwhile, it's still being sold.